and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. This is the Los Angeles Police Academy, main entrance. After weeks of examination, more weeks of intensive training, you come out a rookie police officer. At this academy, you learn to uphold and enforce the laws of your city. I graduated from here. I'm a cop. It was Monday, August 9th. We were working the night watch out of Homicide Division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Warman. My name's Friday. The paper said it was the hottest day of the year. It was 11.47 p.m. In 45 minutes, we'd be off duty and on our way home. Boy, sure is a scorcher, isn't it? Yeah. 11.45 and doesn't even seem to cool off. It's hot. Well, there hasn't been a breath of air all night, Joe. Yeah, I know. Stick your head out there in the court, nothing. Well, we never get in the air in here, anyway. Sometimes the boys down robbery, if they leave the door open, we get a little breeze in the hall. Yeah. Sometimes if wind runs by fast enough, we get a little air in here. Joe, you sure about this coffee? Sure, it tastes all right to me. Why? Who made it? No, I don't mean that, Joe. I mean the theory in back of it. What theory? Well, you know how they say if you drink hot things, it cools you off. If you drink cool things, it makes you warm. Haven't you ever heard that theory? Who says that? Well, I've read it. In school, I took a little bit of medicine. Look, maybe I can explain it to you. They say if you take hot things into your system, like hot coffee or hot tea, then your body sets up a resistance. Psst, cools you right off. But if you take cold things like lemonade, cold water, something like that, your body... Psh, Fights it right back and you get hot. So if you drink hot coffee. Didn't yeah. you ever hear that? Well, just now, yeah. yeah. I got another theory, though. I don't think it's coffee. I, I don't think it has anything to do with that. There's a little gimmick right down here in your stomach. The back or the front of your stomach. It's called the spleen. The what? Spleen. S-P-L-E-E-N. They say that it, they don't know what it does. You know, like they say they don't know what the appendix does? Yeah. Well, I know what the appendix does. It's the oil can of the body. But the spleen, I think it has something to do with that. With what? Well, it cools you off when you're hot, and it heatens you up when it's cold. Where do you get all this stuff? Well, you read, Joe. Gee, you sit around here or at home at night. I try to read, try to improve myself a little, you know. <laughs> yeah. Funny, though. All the stuff you read. Tonight I'm going to read a little when I get into bed. Well, I can't wait to get there. No. You know what I'm going to do when I get home? No. I'm going to take a cold shower, just as cold as I can. Just a minute. That uh, kind of knocks holes in your theory, doesn't it? The cold. What do you mean? Well, you said a cold shower. You take anything cold in it. Oh, Joe, wait a minute. No, look. That's, that's inside. This is external. You take hot things in to make you cool. <laughs> but when you go home, you take a shower and that makes you cool. That's external, Joe. Is that right? Don't fight me, Joe. I've been I'm doing this for years. It doesn't make much sense to me. I don't know where you read that, but I'm sure no doctor would. I'll bring you the book. I read it someplace, one of those little pocket books. Ones. I got <laughs> sure a bunch of them in the back of the car. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah? Is this the homicide department where I report a murder? Yes, yeah, sir, that's right. All right, come on in. You better sit down, son. Right over there. You feel all right? Sure, now that I'm here, I'm all right. Little scratches on your face there. Are you sure you feel all right? No, no, I'm all right. I never thought I'd get here. Times I almost quit, and then I thought of Kevin, what they did to him. And I had to keep walking. I had to for Kevin. I had to. All right, son, let's start at the beginning. 
Tell us all about it. I don't know where to begin. What's your name, young fella? Bruce Hamilton. Bruce is Frank Smith. My name's Friday. What day is today? Monday the 9th. Monday. Then it was Saturday night. Just two days. Seems like ten years. Nightmare. I wish it was a bad dream, but it isn't. He's dead. They really killed him. All right, son, tell us about it. We just finished dinner. Sitting around the fire having coffee. Trying to figure out whose turn it was to do the dishes. Then we heard them. Who's them? Horsemen. A lot of them. They rode right into the camp. One of them yelled something and they all stopped. Stood there looking at us. We didn't know who they were. What they wanted. We just stood there. Then this big guy, I guess he was a leader, said something to us in Spanish. We couldn't understand him. All right, go ahead. You see... Kevin and I go to school together. Summer vacation, and we decided to go to Mexico and do a little prospecting. That's the reason we were there. I see. When we tried to tell him that we didn't know what he was saying, he laughed and turned to the other men, and they laughed too. The big guy said something else to them, and they got off their horses and started to go through our things. Kevin told them not to and started to walk over to them to stop him. And the leader hit Kevin and knocked him down. I started to help Kevin get up, and one of the other men grabbed me and held me. Kevin started to get up, and one of the men went over and kicked him in the face. I didn't know how bad he was hurt. Terrible. No, nothing I could do. Nothing. All right, try to take it easy, son. It's all over with now. Try to calm down. I'm sorry to be such a baby about this, but Kevin was my best friend have to stand around and watch something like that not be able to do anything about it. Take it easy, Bruce. Come on now, tell us the rest of it. I broke away from the one who was holding me and I ran to help Kevin. The big guy grabbed me and hit me in the face and knocked me down and started to kick me. And I got up and tried to get to Kevin to help him. Then I heard a shot. When I looked to where Kevin was, he was all doubled up, holding his stomach. Then the guy shot him again. They all laughed. Thought it was a big joke. I got up, and one of them shot at me. I started running. I ran as fast as I could, but they kept shooting. I thought for sure they'd hit me, and I kind of waited for it. Then I ran through some bushes, and I fell into this gully. When I hit the bottom, I just lay there. What happened then? I could hear them talking and laughing, seem forever. I guess it was only a short time. Then I heard them ride away. I waited until I couldn't hear them anymore, and then I crawled out of the gully to see if they were gone. I wanted to help Kevin. I didn't see anybody, so I walked over to where he was. He was lying on his face. You have no idea how I felt when I turned him over. Yeah, we understand. Go ahead. Right away. I knew he was dead. He was shot in the stomach and in the chest. Shirt was all stained. There was nothing I could do for it. Nothing anybody could do for it. I looked at him for a long time. I guess I cried. Then I thought I'd go to the police. But I was afraid. Afraid of what the police might think when I told them about it. I didn't speak their language, and it was a strange country. I was afraid they wouldn't believe me. Well, what did you do then? I buried Kevin. I looked for something to dig the grave with, but they'd taken everything, even the shovels, everything. I found a tree, and I dug a grave with my bare hands right under it. And I went back, and I got Kevin. <laughs> And I laid him in the grave that I dug for him. <laughs> I said a prayer for him. It was the best I could do. Best I could do. All right, son, try to take it easy. I'm sorry. I'm crying like a kid. I guess you think it's silly. But I can't help it. Nobody gets too old to cry, son. Well, after that, I looked around. They'd stolen everything. Our food, supplies, clothing, everything. And I went to the mesquite bushes where I'd hidden our duffel bag, had our wallet in it, identification, all our money, everything. But it was gone. They'd stolen it too. 
Stolen everything. They didn't leave anything behind, huh? Not a thing. What'd you do then? Started to walk. We'd parked our car just off the highway. It was about five miles. And I remember that the keys to the car were in the duffel bag, too. I didn't know how I was going to get it started, but I thought I'd figure some way. When I got to where we'd parked it, the car was gone. I didn't know what to do. What could I do? Yeah. I started to walk to Ensenada to tell the police. Then I began to think that the bandits had taken my wallet, and I didn't have any identification, no way to prove who I was. I couldn't even speak the language. I got scared that they might not believe me. You walked all the way from Ensenada to the American border? That's right. I walked all night Saturday. Then Sunday morning, I found an old adobe house, and I crawled through a window and slept. I don't know how long I slept, but it was dark when I woke up. So I started to walk again. When I got to the border, I was afraid to go through the gate, so, so I went down to the riverbed and found a hole in the fence. I crawled through and went over to the American side. When I got there, I felt better, safe. I figured I'd go to the first policeman I saw and tell him what happened. Well, did you notify the authorities down in San Diego? No, I, I got to the police station, but I didn't go in. Why not? Well, I still didn't have any identification. I couldn't prove who I was. Nobody to back me up and say who I was. Then I thought of Kevin's mother. If I could get to her, she'd tell me what to do. Well, why didn't you go and see the San Diego authorities? You were close to them down there. You don't understand. Like I said, I didn't have any way to prove who I was. I had no money, my wallet was gone, my clothes were all torn, my face was cut. I thought it'd be better if I could get to Kevin's mother, if I could see her, talk to her. She didn't know what to do. So I hitched a ride. I wanted to go to San Francisco. A truck driver brought me this far. While we were driving, I thought more and more about what I'd say to Kevin's mother. How I'd tell her he was dead. And I couldn't do it. But I had to tell somebody. That's why I came to you. Well, Bruce, we're going to have to go back down to Mexico. You'll be able to show us where the body is, won't you? Well, if I have to go, I guess I can. But I can tell you right where it was. I, I could draw you a map and show you right where he's buried. You want to give us that information now? It was south of Ensenada, about 40 miles, down a new paved highway. You sure it was 40 miles? Yes. While we were driving, Kevin and I were trying to figure out how many kilometers to a mile. I kept watching the speedometer. It was just 40 miles when we turned off the paved highway onto a little dirt road. Can you give us a description of the car, the license number? I don't remember the license number, but the car was a 51 Ford sedan, dark blue. Well, we can check it through DMV. What was Kevin's full name and address? Kevin Allen Bradley. He lived at 6502 Washington Street, San Francisco. He lived with his mother. Apartment on Knob Hill. How about a description of Kevin? Can you give us that? He's about my size, generally. 5'10", 140 pounds, blue eyes. His hair's light, kind of blonde like mine. 22 years old. We looked a lot alike. Kids at school used to think we were brothers sometimes. Joe, we ought to get off a of communication to the Mexican authorities, fill them in, let them know we're coming down. Yeah, you want to contact San Francisco, let them handle that end up there? Get a teletype off to Sacramento, DMV, see if you can get a license number on that car, huh? Yeah, I'll check with Al Gaten in San Diego, too, fill him in. Good idea. Now, Bruce, you'll know these bandits if you see them again, won't you? I might not know some of them, but the big guy, the one that killed Kevin, I could never forget him. The big guy was tall, heavy, over six feet, well over 200 pounds. I'll never forget him, that laugh when he killed Kevin. When he laughed, you could see he had two gold teeth right here, here in front. Mm -hmm. How about the other man, Bruce? Did you get a good look at him? He was a small man, dark like the leader. He wasn't wearing a hat, real thin face. His clothes were all dirty and his pants were torn around the bottoms. He was wearing those leather sandals, the open kind. His feet were filthy, like he hadn't had a bath in a year. You think he'd be able to identify any of the others? I don't know. Maybe if I saw them. Joe. Yeah, Frank. I stopped by R&I, and &I, checked the name Kevin Allen Bradley through. Uh. A teletype here from San Francisco dated July 13th. Missing persons report on Kevin. Want to read it? Well, what's it say? Is a regular missing report? He's described as a male white American, 22 years, 5'10", 140 pounds, blonde, blue eyes, fair complected. At time of disappearance, is wearing a dark blue gabardine suit. Driving a dark blue Ford 1951, license number 1U55887. Something else, Joe. Yeah. He was known to be carrying a sum of money in excess of $1,500 when he disappeared. $1,500, that's a lot of money. Not to Kevin. He was used to carrying that kind of money. You see, his folks were pretty rich. 
He always had all the money he wanted. Mm -hmm. How about this missing report, Bruce? What do you mean? Well, didn't Kevin's mother know that he was going to Mexico? Oh, no. You see, Dad had an argument about where he was going to spend his summer vacation. She wanted him to go to Canada. He wanted to come down here. One afternoon, we just took off. Kevin went to the bank and got the money, and we just took off. He didn't tell his mother anything about it, huh? No. He thought she'd try to stop him. Probably would have, too, if she'd known. Was the money among the things that were stolen from you? Yeah. It was in Kevin's wallet in the duffel bag. I suppose it was kind of foolish to leave that much money just laying around, but we did. We didn't think that anything like this had happened. When I stop and think back over it, Kevin being dead, I don't know. It just sort of makes me sick. Now, you say you didn't have any money. How'd you get along? Well, I, I didn't eat much. Sometimes I'd find some fruit trees along the road. I ate some fruit, that's about all. I didn't think much about food. The important thing was to tell somebody about Kevin being killed. That, that's all I thought about, telling somebody. Yeah, sure. You must be pretty hungry then. Would you like something to eat? Yeah, mine tastes pretty good. Sandwich and some coffee. How about you guys? You gonna eat? Frank, how about it? Yeah. After I get communications off, I'll run across the street and pick up some sandwiches and coffee. Bring them back here. What kind of sandwich do you like, Bruce? Doesn't make any difference. Chicken, I guess. Joe? Oh, ham's all right for me. Tell him put a lot of mustard on it, will you? How about peanut butter? No. Chicken for him, ham for me. Well, Joe, this place I'm going, that's all I have this time of night. Well, why'd you ask us then? Well, I thought I'd try to get you what you wanted if I could. Yeah. Hey, uh, you got any change? All I got's a buck. Yeah. Here, let me get this. What'd you say? Huh? You have some money, do you? Well, I have got ten dollars. I have a ten dollar bill. Thought you said the bandits took all your money. Well, what I meant is I, I didn't think I had any money. I found this ten in my pocket just before I walked in here. Look, you can see it's it's all wadded up. It looked like it'd been in there for a long time. Just a ten all, all wadded up. Yeah, the way it's all rolled up there, you can hardly tell what it is, can you? Yeah, that's right. But you can see it's a ten. See? All wrinkled up. But you can see how I missed it. Yeah, why don't you put everything in your pockets here on the table? Well, why? What did that show? Put it on the table, will you? I haven't got anything in my pockets. Well, you found the ten. Maybe you'll find something else, huh? All right, but I don't see what's going to show. Pocket knife. Handkerchief. And a comb. And the ten that's on the table there, that's all. Maybe there's something in your coat pockets. No, I, I don't carry anything in my coat pockets. Stretches them. Well, take a look, anyway. I told you I don't use them. See? Nothing. What about the inside pockets? No, there's nothing there. Let me have a look. I told you there's nothing there. Well, then you won't mind if I have a look, will you? What's that, Bruce? Why, it's my wallet. I guess they didn't take it after all. Gee, thanks for finding it. You know, I probably wouldn't have thought to look for it. I just figured that it was gone. You want to show us what's in it? Oh, they're just some cards and some personal stuff. Nothing you'd be interested in. I feel pretty silly. I, I forgot all about it. All right, open it up. Sure. Some money in there, isn't there? Yeah. Take it out. Mark fan it out. Quite a bit of money, wouldn't you say, Bruce? Looks to be over a thousand dollars, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I can explain that. Maybe you can explain this. What's that? Name in the wallet, Kevin Bradley. With the finding of Kevin Bradley's wallet and the money, the case had taken a new turn. We questioned Bruce Hamilton about it. He insisted that he thought the wallet and the money had been taken by the bandits when they killed the Bradley boy. While Frank talked to him, I contacted the Mexican authorities and gave them the information. I gave them the description of Kevin Bradley and of Bruce Hamilton. They told me that to the best of their knowledge, there were no bandits operating in the vicinity, but that they would dispatch a search party to go over the area. They said that they'd keep us advised of any developments that might arise. I also contacted the San Francisco Police Department and gave them the information. They said that they'd take care of that end. 12.30 p.m. I've told you all I know. I don't know how the money got there. I was as surprised as you were. Can't understand it. You're making this pretty tough, Bruce. It's kind of hard to buy the fact that over $1,000 in Kevin's wallet turns up in your pocket and you don't know how it got there. But it's the truth. I don't know how I can convince you that it's the truth. Now, look, there are a couple of other things that aren't clear here. What? Tell me. I'm not lying. I've got nothing to hide. What's not right? Tell me. This business of not telling the authorities. I told you. I was scared that they might not believe me. You can understand that, can't you? Up to a point. 
I thought that if I could get to Kevin's mother, then she'd know what to do. Then when I got to L.A., I'd had the chance to think about it, and I couldn't go through with it. I couldn't tell her about it. Another thing, when you told us where we could find the body, you said it was about 40 miles down the paved highway, that right? That's what I said. How long's it been since you've been in Mexico? I told you, i just come back from there. Don't you believe anything I've told you? Now look, Joe and I just came back from an investigation in Mexico. The investigation took us about 70 miles south of Ensenada. We found the highway paved for only about five miles south. You say 40 miles. How do you explain the difference? Maybe I was wrong about the distance. You are pretty sure when you first told us about it. Well, maybe I made a mistake. Something else, Bruce. It's a little hazy here. I told you, I want to help. Anything. How far south of Ensenada did you say you were? I said about 40 miles. Now, I'm not sure. But you are sure that it was south of Ensenada? Yes. And Kevin was killed on a Saturday night? That's right. Then you started for the States right away? That's what I said. I started walking as soon as I found the car was gone. And you walked all the way to the border? That's right. How'd you walk? What route did you take? I told you I stayed off the road. I was afraid of bandits coming back. I walked along the roadside and then through the hills. I got off the roadside whenever I saw anybody coming. But you walked all the way? That's right. All the way from Ensenada to the border. And it took you how long? Saturday night and Sunday night. I got a ride in San Diego in the morning. What time do you figure that you started for the border? Maybe 11.30, midnight. I don't know for sure. And you stopped at dawn? Yeah, I stopped and slept. Then I woke up and I started to walk again. Then you're asking us to believe that you walked over 100 miles in less than 14 hours. Is that right? And through country like that down there? I don't know how long it took. I, I just walked. I didn't keep track of how long. No, it doesn't gel, Bruce. You're telling us that story and then showing up here with Kevin's wallet and the money. I told you. I don't know how that happened. What are you trying to prove? We're not trying to prove anything, Bruce. We just want the facts. I'm trying to give them to you, but you keep mixing me up. You got it wrong. You're mixing it up. What do you think? That I'm making this whole thing up? Look at my face. Look here. Does that look like my imagination? No, but those cuts could be self-inflicted. Why would I want to do a thing like that? What reason would I have for doing a thing like that? That's what we're trying to find out. You could have gotten those in a fight with Kevin. Maybe he didn't want you to take the money. You keep talking about the money. I try to tell you, I don't know how the money got in my pocket. I don't know anything about it. You think I killed Kevin, is that right? Looks that way, doesn't it? But he was my best friend. I had no reason to kill him. He was my friend. Now, you look, we better lay this thing out for you, Bruce. You open up a whole can of beans here. You waltz in here and give us a cock and bull story about this killing. Parts of your story we can't buy. Why are you trying to sell it to us? You lied about the road. You lied about the money. The story about how you walk doesn't ring. You want to know what we think, Bruce? We think the whole thing's a lie from start to finish, a lie. Now, you come off it. Who killed Kevin Bradley? I don't know. I don't know. Get it straight, Bruce. Did you kill him? Huh? Did you kill Kevin Bradley? Is that the reason for this story? No, no, I didn't. Well, somebody did. Can you tell us who? You're getting me all mixed up. Well, you're the one that's mixing it up, Bruce. We just want to know who killed Kevin Bradley. We think maybe it was you. Looks like it might have been. No, it couldn't be. Leave me alone. I I didn't do it. Why couldn't you have done it? It looks like you did. Because Kevin Bradley isn't dead. What's that? He was never killed. I'm Kevin Bradley. Bradley, L-E-Y? Yeah, L-E-Y. Uh -huh. Wounds self-inflicted. Think you'll be on that one o'clock plane? I don't know. It's hard to tell. Yeah. A guy like this, I never can figure out. He comes from a good family, a lot of money. I don't know. Yeah. Why would he tell a big lie like that? Beat himself up. We worked 15 minutes overtime tonight? Yeah, put in for it. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, that coffee's cold. Well, don't drink it. Why? Make you hot. Tuesday, August 10th, the meeting was held in the captain's office homicide division. In a moment, the results of that meeting. The suspect confessed the entire story was a lie. He told the investigating officers he wanted his death to be officially reported to his parents. 
According to his statement, in that way, he felt he could start a new life without family domination, which he claimed was excessive in his home. 